now hopefully PowerPoint will not interfere. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today's uh, speaker is uh, Sridhar Kumar Narsimhan. It's a pleasure to welcome him. He's from the Chemical Engineering Department at IIT Madras. Uh, he got, he was uh, integrated uh, MTech student at IIT Bombay. Then he went to a cold climb uh, to Clarkson University in the United States, which is in upstate New York, and uh, got his PhD there. But before that, he actually had worked at LNT, I noticed. Um, then uh, he wanted a colder place, so he went to Trondheim, Norway. Uh, but in Norway, they had 24 7 water supply, and uh, it was also too cold, so he wanted a new challenge. So he went, came to Chennai, where uh, we don't have uh, either of those, <laughs> either of those, and it's also quite hot there. So he was missing the hot climate in Chennai, perhaps. Okay, so uh, I think he's been there since about 2008, and uh, he's now an associate professor there. So uh, I came to know of his work at the recent Tech Expo in August uh, in New Delhi, when we were presenting some of our work on water distribution networks, and uh, we thought that there was some commonality, and so we wanted to hear him about the works that he had done. So, over to you. He's going to tell us about what it's supposed How much time do I have? One hour. Uh, thanks to Rajesh for the introduction, and thanks to Rajesh, Professor Montemar, and the Robert Bush Center for inviting me here. And uh, I'm with the Department of Chemical Engineering, and also with the other Robert Bosch twin, we have a Center for Data Science and AI, uh, which came into maybe a couple of years ago. So, some of our work has been supported by Timidras DST and the Robert Bosch Center. Uh, this is just, incidentally, Norway was not as cold as Potsdam. Uh, Clarkson was much colder. There was a couple of occasions I've seen minus 40. It didn't go as cold in Norway. But it was much darker and much more sunnier in winter and summer, respectively. So I'm basically a control, I trained as a control and systems engineer. I worked on sensor placement, uh, optimization, and the like. And for the last six or seven years, thanks to my colleague Shankar Narsimhan and B.S. Murthy, uh, Murthy is in civil engineering. Uh, I've been looking at several problems in water distribution networks. And other thing, other problems that I've looked on as a chemical engineer are continuous manufacturing. One common thread is that I try and formulate uh, tractable, uh, try formulate and solve tractable optimization problems. Uh, so, for instance, I'll be talking to you about uh, optimal scheduling in water supply networks. So, this is in uh, in water networks. We looked at several uh, problems, right from theoretical and algorithmic levels to going all the way up to field level implementation. So we looked at uh, oh. Thanks. Uh, so we looked at uh, some of these problems. I heard several people here also working on where do you place optimally place sensors uh, so that you can maximize the quality of information that you get. So this could be used for reconstructing the complete state of your network, or it could be used for maximizing maximizing the resolving or detecting detectability of leaks. Uh, then this was the first paper. One of the first things that we did was on. Uh, uh, optimal control of uh, continuously operated net 24 7 operated networks but with storage facilities so this is not a very well researched problem but it turns out that it's actually very common uh, for instance new york city any building which is more than six stories tall has a water tower and therefore you know they get 24 7 there is a storage facility at the top of the tank water is pumped uh, to the uh, water water what they call water tower and uh, it's, it's and the end consumers get by and the inhabitants of the building get to water supplied by gravity. Uh, so we looked at a continuous optimal control problem using model bit to control. Uh, then uh, we looked at problems which are more relevant in the Indian context, which is operated or operation of intermittently operated networks. How do you operate them efficiently? E more importantly, in the Indian context, is equitably. And likewise, in poorly instrumented networks, such as in uh, most networks in India, how do you isolate leaks using only flow balances and and how do you carry out a, uh, very well structured in uh, measurement campaign to be able to resolve the leaks to a degree, desired degree of resolution. So as part of a water uh, DST project, uh, which is funded by Water Technology Initiative, I'll show you some more details about this. We set up a, a lab scale network, which is a fairly complex network, re completely reconfigurable to test out some of these ideas. So we could test out our ideas on leak detection. We test, we test out our ideas on leak detection and I'll also show you how we tested our ideas on scheduling. And uh, as part of the same WTI project, uh, WTI wants a lot of uh, 
they want to see you go uh, from the lab to the field. So they were very keen that we show some of these demonstrations in at least the IIT Madras campus in the first round. So we were able to do some pilot demonstrations in IIT Madras. And uh, as an ongoing water project with IIT Madras, Bombay, uh, we are looking at, uh, I'll show you, I'll talk about it very briefly, uh, about uh, doing a scheduled supply in a multi-village scheme <coughs> in uh, Palgar district, which is on 90 kilometers north of Mumbai. I'll show you some snaps of what we have done over there and what our plans are for that particular project. So again, I, sh I sh don't have to belabor this point, but these are some statistics about how, and, and feel free to correct me if I have got any of these numbers wrong. But I think the uh, you know the consensus is that there is you know our current there is a significant uh, difference between what the ground reality is and what the ideal targets are in terms of the supply of water or how many how much what percentage of population you want to cover metering. Several cities have nil to nil metering, and I'm very glad to know that Bangalore seems to have metered a significant proportion of the consumers. <coughs> Huge amount of water to get lost to leakages, uh, intermittent supply, and uh, uh, <coughs> uh, poorly instrumented. And of course, there are exceptions, and uh, Bangalore, I should add, as an exception to this because it seems to be very reasonably well instrumented, and you're also able to collect significant amount of data in a near real time basis. <coughs> So some of the issues with the water distribution networks, WDN is by the water distribution networks, uh, and some of these are especially relevant in the Indian context, but some of these are also globally relevant. A significant amount of water is lost due to leaks, it's poor recovery, poor instrumentation. The energy water nexus is, uh, reveals that a significant amount of energy is used to generate or to transport, generate and transport water from the source to the consumers, and likewise, significant amount of water is used in energy gen in uh, conventional. Uh, power generation, for instance, coal and thermal. Uh, then there is a what I will be talking about this amount, how uh, how much energy is used to transfer the water, transport the water from the source to the consumers. Then there seems to be a significant mismatch between what it was designed for and how you operate. For instance, most networks are operated intermittently in India, but they are never designed to be operated intermittently. They are all designed under con uh, under conventional norms of 24/7 operation. And Professor Mohan Kumar, am I right on that? Uh, and that again, you can imagine that uh, uh, that is one of the reasons why we see a significant difference in the way in which are the, in the loss in performance and also the way they are operated. And uh, uh, how this results in intermittent, several other factors result in intermittent supply and inequitable distribution. So, uh, just a very, very brief introduction. Should I assume that? Uh, should I? No, no, go through it. Yeah. Not everybody's a water. Exactly, yeah, that's yeah. right. Sorry. So, this is just a cartoon picture of water distribution network. So, as Professor Mohan Kumar was pointing out, there are, you know, these are, in some sense, these things replicate at scales. So, this is, for instance, a reservoir from which treated water is pumped through several overhead tanks, and from where, you know, water is usually supplied by gravity to the end consumer. So, you could want to think of these as a supply or transmission side, and this is a distribution side. Some of the problems that I'll be talking about, the distribution could be, you know, if it is a, if a consumer receives water continuously, you see a sim, some, what similar kind of a, supply pattern basically based to that's because the water is being supplied continuously you know there are certain peaks that you see during the day on the other hand it could also be intermittent where you get water only a few hours a day or a few days in a week for instance uh, uh, the supply could also be the supply problem which is what i'll be talking about but whatever i talk about today can also be applied to the distribution side so the supply problem is usually deciding how to fill these reservoirs and how to uh, empty these reservoirs so you want to come up with basically uh, you know, a policy or pattern for filling and emptying these reservoirs. So, I'll again, uh, because this is uh, the approach that I'll be talking about is complementary to what Rajesh and Professor Mohan Kumar have been working on. So, we are going to, I'll just contrast between two different ways in which you can operate these net. Oh, this is, of course, continuous versus 24 7 operation. Uh, intermittent versus 24 7 op continuous operation, 24 7. In 24 7 operation, you manipulate the valves which affect the pressure and therefore the flow rate. In intermittent operation, because water is supplied only intermittently, you have to have storages at, at different scales. You could have storage uh, some, or if you're talking of a, a supply network, in the, like in the previous slide, you could have significant amount of storage also at the supply side. So you manipulate the valve, it affects the flow rate, affects the pressure and the outflow rate, and therefore affects your water level in your storage facility. In continuous 24 7 operation, the pipelines are being pressured all the time, and uh, therefore, some amount of continuous control is needed because 
uh, you have to meet the peak demands. So you need to be able to manipulate either the pumps or the valves on a continuous basis to be able to meet the peaks and also to therefore uh, uh, and uh, to meet the peaks. Uh, in intermittent operation, because you have storage, you could think about supplying water ahead of the peak and uh, trying to even out these peaks. So the, again, what that means is, you know, water supply at preceding time periods will have a direct effect. There is uh, how much water you supply at the pre preceding time will have an effect. Will have direct coupling to how much water you are going to supply in the future. This direct coupling does not exist in 24/7 because instantaneous demands are assumed to be met. Again, intermittent operation is very common, but not well studied. Uh, whereas, uh, if you take into account, uh, look into scheduling problem and operation problem of water networks, most of them talk about uh, continuous uh, supply, uh, and very few papers talk about intermittent operation. Again, I'll talk about you know what is the difference between uh, why you do you see. Again, this is what I mentioned. The networks in, uh, never meant to be designed for intermittent operation. They're meant to be uh, designed. They're designed assuming 24/7 operation, but in the, in the end, operated intermittently. There are some, uh, you know, limitations of the ex existing infrastructure. Uh, that's old. The growth could have been much beyond projections. We also see in several cases when there are inadequacies in designs and, of course, source availability. During operation, because these are intermittent, they are uh, intermittently operated, which means there are valvemen who go around opening and closing valves. So they, when I say intermittent operation, some people get water, a certain part of the network, a certain number of consumers get water for a certain number of hours in a day. So obviously somebody has to go and open these valves, close these valves. So there's also limited, uh, surprisingly, in the um, manpower available for such operation is also limited. And because these are usually driven by experience and uh, heuristics, these schedules need not be the optimal ones. They may not even be... Uh, no, guarantee they may you could get up you could my that could be better schedules better ways of operating this network there is limited instrumentation and therefore you have very limited com and limited communication and you have therefore very limited uh, feedback and all of this finally you can say is limited results in lim inadequate control during operation so I'll give you a simple example of uh, this is from a textbook on uh, analysis of water distribution networks by professor Bhave and Gupta uh, so this is a simple example uh, which was desired, I think they talked about this is Osmanabad which is a district in uh, Maharashtra. Single overhead tank supplying water to six beneficiary villages. We assume that each of these villages has a uh, tank from which water will be supplied to the individual residents of this village. So as far as design is concerned, uh, you know, these are eight hour demands. So this is in cubic meters per hour, assuming water is supplied for eight hours. So this was how it was, each of these villages over here, each of these tanks was, the network was designed so that all of these demands could be met. Now uh, why do we need, uh, if you however, this is at the design stage. So what the design stage, what is done is what's called uh, demand driven analysis. You see whether the network is capable of meeting these demands. However, in operation is actually, uh, when you operate a network, that is when you open up, all, what happens when you actually open up all these valves to the, all these tanks, what happens? It turns out that because these two, uh, you can see over here, uh, yeah, this guy and this village, this tank over here, because of the hydraulic, uh, the elevation and the hydraulic uh, hydraulics of this network, they don't end up getting any water, even though they was designed to get 9.4 cubic meters per hour, and it actually got zero. This guy was designed to, this particular thing was designed to get 6 but ended up getting 40 cubic meters per hour because they were hydraulically favorable. So what this means is, and of course there is a significant difference between demand and supply uh, for most of, for this guy, this one and these two villages are not getting any water. So obviously you need to do some amount of control, right? you need to intervene and do some amount of control to ensure that uh, the demands are met. So what is one way to do that? One way is to use a continuous control valve. So each of these, uh, in, the, in the inlet of each of these tanks, you install a, con a control valve. What happens is it manipulates that valve, it adds an extra amount of resistance and therefore it affects the outlet flow rate. So what would you <coughs> want to do is, you know, in some sense, because this guy is getting much more than what he needs, you have to artificially increase the resistance of this particular tank over here. Because they are hydraulically favorable, they may have been at a much lower elevation as compared to any of these other guys. So you need to artificially increase the resistance to this tank and uh, you know some of the other tanks and therefore what we call throttle those valves and therefore increase the resistance to this guy and some of the other guys hopefully 
this will result in an increase in water supply to the other villages for instance this person and this guy and you should hopefully uh, see the demands being met uh, however so, it is question. yeah so, the supply seem to exceed the demand yeah and that's because there's more supply uh, no because this pers this tank is actually uh, when you i was just counting all the supplies together yeah it will be it, it could be it could end up exceeding yeah. because what happens is actually i should also plot, plot it um, in the design stage if you had looked at the demand and analysis the residual pressures here are much more than the minimum pressures which are required so in the design stage you also try to ensure that you size your pipes in a manner such that the residual pressures are met so what happens over here is the residual pressures are much more than what these what is really needed so in the end it ends up these people end up consuming much more so so yeah it is possible that the total supply is much more than what the demand is so what is to be done is you you put a continuous control valve and just as you have a, our household tap you, you know open it you don't either open it completely you don't close it completely you keep it at an intermediate level so that some of these hydraulically privileged people you increase the resistance and indirectly you decrease the resistance to the other hydraulically uh, disadvantaged people uh however it is not appropriate it's not trivial to determine the appropriate control valve settings uh because a control valve is a very very non linear element unlike it's not it's not it doesn't have a linear behavior at all so more importantly if you make a change in one valve it affects this resistance and therefore it ends up affecting the flow in all other part of the network so it is not us it it's, it becomes a multi variable control problem so if there are six demand points over here it becomes a problem of 6 by 6 control 6 input 6 outputs all of these are interacting with each other and if you change if you make a change in the valve setting of this guy the flow rates and all other places also ends up getting changed so that is a coupling it is not trivial to determine the settings more importantly if you want to attain this particular demand flow rate you need to close the loop between a control valve and the flow so you need to sense the flow if the flow is not equal to the demanded flow at the set point you need to readjust the control valve setting and to get that and control valves, as uh, Sheetal was mentioning, the flow continuous control valves, the flow control valves are uh, reasonably as kind of expensive, much more expensive than a normal valve, which is a two-way valve, which is you can either open it or close it. And what we believe is, you know, you could just use the existing valves in an on-off manner. That is, you either open the valve completely or close the valve completely. So what that happens is, uh, you know, it uh, the only the handle that you have therefore is which valve to open and for how long. So rather than deciding what should be the flow rate in individual lines, I will decide how long I should keep these valves open. And that is, a, that is something which is easier to, for instance, a person in the field to implement, because all he has to bother, all he has to notice how long the valve was open. Rather than having a sensing element for the flow and a, and a, and a flow control valve and closing the control. Uh, so the time of operation directly will affect how much water is supplied and you can obviously you know pass on this information to the operator and say open this valve for a certain amount of time close this valve for a certain amount of time rather than tell him adjust the settings so that you get a certain amount of flowing and uh, if you are again just as there are level measurement can serve because you are going to fill up the tank uh, level measurement can also serve as a proxy for how much water has been supplied rather than monitoring what is the flow rate in the uh, different parts of the network so this is again the same Usmanabad network. So this is, I use the control valve at a constant setting. So which means that for all the seven, I, uh, I, I, I uh, throttled, as, a, as I said, increase the resistance in some part of the network. And then uh, for, and kept the level, kept these settings constant for all the seven hours. So it turns out by using this kind of a policy, you can end up in all the demands are exactly met. And the way to read this graph is, uh, you know the width of the cell indicates uh, the fraction this width is one hour the fraction of the cell indicates how much what is the if the full box is covered it is 40 cubic meters per hour so this tells you roughly around one third of 40 around uh, uh, 13 cubic meters per hour is supplied over here so uh, which means that particular tank 2 it's a high demand and therefore that it receives a significant amount of water tanks 4 and 5 are you know they they demand much less supply and therefore they are throttled to a larger extent and they get uh, the supply. It turns out by doing this policy, each of these villages, each of these consumers gets exactly what that is demanded for. Now on the other hand, if you had now some change, suppose the first three tanks, you know they uh, there was some uh, increase in demand, which means you now have to go back 
and readjust these control valve settings and as you can see there is a significant difference between this setting and this setting or rather there is some difference and it is not immediately obvious how to do this. Suppose suppose at the field level implementation they said you know this week the three villages 2, 3 and 4 are expecting a large number of visitors or there is a function or some event is happening and therefore they are expected to consume a lot more water. You need to readjust these valve settings for all the villages not just 2, 3 and 4. If you can see the, all the villages you have to readjust the settings to be able to get the uh, supplied water. So this is not a trivial task is what our, our claim is. On the other hand you could do a simpler fit. You could do a simpler thing. What we, what Professor Bhave calls uh, operator-based solution. So what he what he suggests is, uh, you know, you open all valves at a time, and you know what happens when all valves are open. This guy gets no water, and this guy gets no water. But this guy gets far more than six cubic meters per hour. So it is likely that his supply, his demand, and his demand is going to get full for, met first. And as this demand is met, you close that particular valve. So as and when a demand is met, you close that particular valve. So this is what was Bhavya in his book calls operator-based solution. And then this is again the same thing. So it, it turns out that in 6 hours, 31 minutes, all the demands are met. Only thing is, villages 4 and 6 don't get water for the first one and near 1 hour, 20 minutes. Then uh, 4 still does not get. 4 starts getting water only after, uh, you know, one, two hours, three, no, about four hours. So they have to wait for a significant amount of time before they get even the first drop of water. And over here, what happens after this? Village three's demand is met, so the valve to the village three is closed. So you can ask this question: Is this the only way you can operate? This, uh, this is a simple, this is one intuitive way of doing it. You open all the valves. Whenever somebody's demand is met, automatically you close that particular valve. So this is not the only way you could operate. What we have, what we are going to now show in this, uh, what I'm going to show is, formulate this as an exit optimization problem, where I will schedule the operation of these tanks, of these valves, and also pumps if necessary, to be able to supply the time varying forecasted demand. The objective being to, in this case, this was a gravity driven system, so there was no explicit energy expense. But if it is a pumped system, I would want to minimize energy. If it is a gravity driven system, what we are doing is we are trying to minimize the amount of time that it takes to fill this. So here it turns out that uh, 6 hours 31 minutes is the time that it takes for Professor Bhavi's solution which is what he calls open all the valves and close one at a time. We can come up with a solution which is in this case the difference is not significant but I will also show how this may not be able, you may not be able to account for all possible cases. If you formulate it explicitly as an optimization problem you can also add in constraints. So I will show you some of the constraints that we have included and how you can realize these. Uh, so, the optimization problem is to schedule the operation of pumps and valves. Uh, in this case, I am going to limit myself to on-off valves. I hope I convinced you about why we are looking at uh, only looking at these valves as either on or off rather than as a continuous control valve to meet the supply to meet the forecasted time varying demand. The objective to be me to minimize the energy, reduce the time. These are relevant if there is enough water. If there is not enough water, uh, yeah, sir. Assuming that the tanks at each location have capacity which is fixed in the beginning itself, because in the previous solutions you could have developed some buffer for the. So the capacities are fixed. So all the capacities are fixed. And which is matched to the demand. No, so roughly uh, in rural areas, I think the CPHO manual suggests about a third, uh, the, they are sized to meet about a third uh, of your daily demand. And these over these over reservoirs are uh, sized to meet around one sixth of the total demand uh, because they expected to fill around you know five to six empty five and fill around fill and empty around five six to eight times in a day. Is that correct? But, but how will it, you keep it open for a longer time, then you can't you will only meet up to filling the tank, right? That's only one third. Of the no, no, so, thing. but. Pardon? Oh, so we, you will fill through, you won't fill only once a day, right? You will fill continuously through the day. No, no, I think his doubt is as he is filling, he is not giving any demand further down of the, say, that last load. Yeah. The supply is not there. Uh, sir. Uh, that also is one uh, of the examples I will show. As as you are filling, are you supplying is the question, right? The yeah. level will vary. Yeah. So that, that also. Not that. that will come later, but right now. Yeah, right now, this is a, this example, just I am fill just filling, the water, filling and giving it to you. Then you will give the. You, because this takes only six hours. So I could start this operation early in the morning at five. And by 11, I filled all the tanks. And then I asked the operators to start supplying water from 11. 
and practically it doesn't if you are going anywhere going to have a, if you are going to repeat this in a cyclical manner you know you would get water every starting at 11 o'clock in the morning at every day Said, like, can the tanks hold one day's worth of... No, so but that would mean, if you could do that, but that would also mean you have to have a very large capacity tax. Okay. So that increases the civil cost. Then how does the demand is met? Like, it can only meet one third of it. So this is, this is for eight, as I said, for eight hours. So you repeat this, uh, you know, this is a demand in eight hours. Or what I mean is, it could be the entire day's demand I'm trying to meet in eight hours. Another way to think about this is, this is a 24 hour demand which I'm trying to meet in eight hours. Oh, you cannot do that, right? Because you don't have the capacity to keep that much. So you'll have to do it three times, and you're hoping that in the first. You could do that. That is one way. Another way to think about this is I'm trying to I repeat this every three every three, three times in a day. Yeah, yeah repetition is possible. You cannot accumulate like yeah. that. Yeah. The, the size is not. The sizes are, you would be prohibitively expensive to hold. See, one uh, thing in all this, as I think you were not stressing. Sorry, I think yeah. the civil costs are extremely high. They want to optimize on that. So we are not talking about. As much as possible, keep minimal, but still be able to address the issue. So there is an additional constraint which people are talking about. You have to also say that you can only fill as much as you can store. You cannot yes. store more. Yeah, exactly. Those constraints will be there. So we will make sure that all those constraints are explicitly handled. The capacity, oh, you, your tank will never overflow. It will never run dry. And even though in this particular example there was no withdrawal from these tanks, I'll also show you an example that we have, uh, the first example, the results that I'll show you, where that is actually continuous withdrawal is possible. So very similar to your Devanu. And I have uh, some, ex I'll talk about some uh, Devanu problem also. Okay. So in the these, these objectives of minimizing time and energy are relevant if there is enough water. What do you do if there is actually not enough water? It is not just enough to minimize time or energy because what could happen is, you might end up with some consumers are hydraulically privileged as I said, they might end up getting more amount of water. So they, what we need to do is uh, actually minimize or max, mi maximize the equity in distribution. So the way we, we calculate equity is you ensure that the percentage deviation from what they actually ideally need is min is minimized or is, is the same for uh, you minimize the percentage deviation for all the consumers. So if you want 100 but you only got 80, another consumer who wants 500 should also get only 80% of that, only 400. So you don't end up getting giving him 500 and giving me 80 because I am a less privileged, I am a hydraulically less privileged consumer. So the percentage deviation should be minimized for all the consumers put together. You could also minimize, you could also put other objectives such as minimize the worst case deviation and so on. So again, just to recap, the objective, the shed, we can formulate this as a scheduling problem where the objective is to minimize energy or maximize the water amount supplied or maximize the equity by deciding which pumps, if there are several pumps in your network, you could also ask which pump should I turn on or off, which valves to be turned open and closed, and for how long. The constraints are, you know, they, at no point at the time can the tank overflow, can it run dry, because you could also have, in the Osmanavad example, I assume there is no withdrawal, but you could also have simultaneous withdrawal from the tanks. So you don't want a situation where the tank is running dry, and the total water has to be the same as the daily demand. And if there is withdrawal, you have to ensure that the tanks don't run dry. If it's a pump system, the pumps have physical limitations. Right? They can only pump, they have to follow what's called a pump operating curve. And if you're trying to talk of a daily schedule, the total amount of time has to be less than 24 hours. If you're trying to make a weekly schedule, it has to be 24 times seven, those many number of hours. So this, will, I, will not give the, I will not give you the complete formulation as such, but I'll just tell you what is the nature of this problem. First, in a pipe flow, fluid flow in a pipe, it's very similar to current flow. That needs that needs to be a driving force for just as you need volt, potential difference for current to flow. Current flows from higher potential to lower potential. Water flows from a higher higher pressure to a lower pressure, roughly speaking. Unlike uh, ohmic circuits, ohmic elements, pressure flow relationship is non-linear. The flow is the pressure drop is proportional to Q power 1.85 for most uh, hydraulic flows over here. So that introduces one nature of non-linearity. The other nature of non-linearity comes in the pump operating curve that I mentioned. If you want to think of the pump as an ideal voltage source, an ideal battery, if you recall, should supply the same amount of voltage irrespective of what current you have. But then you know that all batteries have internal resistance, so therefore it actually slopes down. Uh, I mean, but when you look at again an ohmic circuit, uh, ohmic element, these are rather traditional electrical things. The, the, uh, v versus I curve for an ideal bat for a battery with some internal resistance is linear. For pumps, it's a non-linear curve, so it drops down in a non-linear manner. Then the uh, if what happened the 
energy or the power consumed by the pump uh, power delivered is equal to the product of just as in a uh, in a battery the power is equal to voltage times current in this case the power is equal to the pressure drop pressure head developed by the pump times the flow rate however the efficiencies are not the same at all points in this curve so the efficiencies are for this point it is point 8 when you go away from this curve it is point 7 so the efficiencies are usually maximum for the point at which it was designed for but you may operate at a wide other range of points so the efficiencies are also different at different points so all of these are so a significant amount of non linearity what is the x axis ah uh, sorry this is uh, it got cut this is pressure and flow so just as you have v versus i for an ideal an ideal ideal pump would have a flat operating the pressure developed by the curve pump would be ideally constant irrespective of what flow uh, uh, was delivered by the pump but you know it usually just as in a battery with an internal resistance it slopes down with a, a constant slope here it is a non linear relationship and uh, as i said we are working with discrete valves which means the valve can be either on or off so you take the 24 hours you might want to think about slotting them making you know one hour or half an hour or whatever time slots to the day so let's say you have divided your time slot of horizon of 24 hours into a uh, i max number of slots so for each slot you have to decide which valve is open which pump is uh, to, uh, if there is if there are several pumps which pump is uh, turned on so for instance in this case the first time slot all the three valves are open and this uh, pump is uh, pump is running in the second time slot you close the valve number 1 you open the valve number 2 and you keep the pump running for the third time slot nothing is happening why why would you have a case when nothing is happening it is because there's already some water if you had possibly pumped water during this time it could have overflow so maybe your this is at a time when the demand is not much there is not much consumption and therefore if you had pumped water into this tank it would have overflow so that could you would still need times in which there is no pumping going on so uh, clearly there are integer variables the status of these pump, pumps and valves and it's a non linear problem because of your flow versus uh, head relationship your pump operating curve so let's do a very simple counting of how many variables you need so if there are uh, <coughs> uh in for each of these you need to have one binary variable to decide whether it is on or off so suppose there are n pipes n valves and pumps you need to have n into i max so many number of binary variables and of course for each of these time slots there is the pressures in all the points of the network and the flows in all the elements of the all the uh, edges of the network so it's a uh, it's a mixed integer non linear problem and computationally challenging there are both continuous variables and dis discrete variables so what we do is this is one uh, because this is uh, because we are also working with uh, no on off valves this we allow we are allowed a certain amount of decomposition what that does is we can decouple the hydraulics from the optimization so i'll give you a simple example with you know uh, a single pump supplying water to three overhead to three tanks now again this is a difference between the way uh, tanks are filled in what are called fill and draw reservoirs water is filled from the top of the tank and withdrawn from the bottom so uh, let's say that you know i'm give, uh, this is a car, even though this looks like it is being filled from the bottom please ignore that it is actually being filled from the top so this is what i call a state 3 where the valve to tank 1 is closed and valve to tank 2 and 3 are open so what happens is uh, because uh, the what, now the flow rate into t2 and t3 does not depend on really the levels in 2 and 3 or does not depend on the level in 1 because i'm filling it from the top of the tank so the Uh, and there are only eight number of finite number of combinations for these valves all close uh, one open or all open all close and all the other six combinations over here so for one of them is a trivial case when all valves are closed which means no flow rate so for all the seven cases i do a hydraulic modeling or simulation and then i predict or calculate the flow rates into all the tanks and for each what i call each of these configurations i call a state so this state one is Valve to three is open. State two is valve to two is open. State three means valve to one zero is valve to three, one is closed and uh, two and three are open. For each of these, I do a hydraulic simulation. I record what are the flow rates into the tanks, and I also record if there's a pump over here. I also record and store what is the power delivered by the pump. So I record the flow rate into each tank and the power consumed. So now what happens is. i can completely de and this kind of hydraulic simulation is uh, relatively easier to do than coupling it directly embedding it directly into my optimization problem and this is somewhat similar to what you have done you have 
using epanet as an oracle to call and predict this but the only difference being because we have a finite number of uh, com uh, configurations possible for the decision space the valve can be either open or closed and there are eight tanks two uh, sorry three tanks two to the two to power three equal to eight combinations in your they know there are 10 11 tanks seven valves so two power 11 which is uh, 2048 combinations which are possible so you just do hydraulic simulation for all the 2048 combinations, store the flow rates and store it. That is, we are working with continuous control valves. There are obviously, now it can, you don't know what, there are uh, infinite number of combinations possible for each of these valves. So the state space in that sense is not finite. In this case, it is that the state, what we call state space is, or the, your, your input space or a uh, space of feasible decision variables is really finite in this case. But uh, scalability seems to be an issue because uh, I mean, they've known was a uh, four kilometers by four kilometers by four kilometers yes. triangular area. Mm -hmm. We wanted to include one more, and that would double the number of variables. And uh, so, yeah, so can't does, hope to that is a doubling over there. Of course, with each extra tank, each extra valve or extra tank, there is an increase in the number of simulations that you need to do. So two options. Uh, one, we have come up with a way in which you work with a reduced order model. You don't enumerate all the states explicitly. You keep building on the number of states in a so-called greedy or heuristic manner. And that is something which we have verified. For instance, with Osmanabad network, there were six tanks. So two power five, two power six, 64 combinations. We were able to get a good enough solution by just enumerating about a fraction of these 30, 15 states. And this is something which we also validated experimentally. And experimentally means in our lab. So, the issue of scalability can get addressed if we may not be able to guarantee optimality, but you know our experience has been that we are able to get close enough solutions for the limited class of networks that we have looked at. We are not yet done there. They, for Devanur, we took it's only 2048 combination, so we have done that. I have some figures, but I will not. Uh, I would need to because I was, uh, based on our discussions today, we I asked our uh, student friends to run, you know, former colleagues to run this. So I won't guarantee the results, but it looks like it's a feasible solution can be obtained by using just on-off maps. So the scheduling problem is if I show pictorially, each state is one, each box is one color. Color means which state it is in. So you need to decide which state is active and for how long. So you could either decide upfront that I'm going to slot each of these into 15 minute or half an hour or one hour intervals, or you could also say I don't upfront decide how long it should be, but I also how long I don't upfront decide what should be the length of this time slot. That also comes as an output of my decision variable. And the constraints are now the hydraulics is completely decoupled. Now it's clearly just a filling problem, a conservation problem. Water is going to a tank at a certain rate, and what rate that is, that depends on which color box I am operating and not and how much water gets accumulated, that depends on how long I'm operating this particular state and how long how much water you're withdrawing so it's a simple if you can i won't i don't have the i have the equations over here it is you can see that it's a, it's a linear problem because that is all the non-linearities have been have been taken away you could and this does this uh uh then the constraints are the the same amount number of constraints you have to meet instantaneous demand if there is instantaneous demand you cannot run a tank to run dry you cannot run the tank to uh, uh you cannot let the tank to empty and the only other concern is at one point in time, only one colored box can sit over here. That is only one particular configuration of valves can be opened. Now there are two power because there are n valves or pumps. Uh, there are two to the power two to the power of n states, and we don't know which of these two power n states is active over here. So if you have an indicator variable for each of these, you need to have two power n binary variables decide telling you which of these uh, states is active. And if there are i max total number of sl slots. It still has a binary, it's a large scale integer linear problem with having i max times 2 to the power of n binary variables. It's still a challenging problem because now you have a significantly large number of binary variables. So what do we do? We use this idea which has been, you know, that uh, <coughs> we decouple the problem. That is what I say. When I say decouple the problem, I still decompose it. So what I've done so far is I have decomposed the or decoupled the hydraulics from the optimization. I'm going to do one more level of decoupling. I'm going to assume that instantaneous demand I am not bothered. So let me think, look at this. Suppose this is my total schedule and this tells me this dark color brown tells me that this has to be active for a certain amount of time and then this is a light brown color it tells me this is active. So let me look at the blue one over here. The total time for which this is active is the length of this box plus the length of this box I put it together over here. So rather than asking how long each uh, uh, rather than asking for this entire schedule if I ignore instantaneous withdrawal that is, I just assume that my only task is to supply this total amount of water. So each tank 
can get water from all of these states and therefore the total amount of water has to be supplied that is only constant over here i decouple the consumption part so i decouple the i ignore the stimulus consumption and only say a certain amount of water has to be supplied so what roughly this means is my decision variable is not uh, how long each state is active for and when it is just what fraction of time the blue color guy is active what fraction of time this uh, whatever color this is light brown color is active what fraction of time the dark brown color is active what fraction of time the light green color is active so rather than uh, asking what is my complete schedule i only ask this one question out of all the two power n states what fraction of time each of these states is active and the physical justification why we think this idea will work is you know i said each the there's a even though we said it's only third storage third days the storage is only for a third of the capacity there is a significant amount of capacity available so you could think about this you know there is a one third capacity available you could buffer it right i am not i am currently decoupling the consumption from the supply my physical uh, guide, uh, guide uh, principle that is guiding me is there is always some storage available which i can use to buffer and then supply ahead and, and then uh, supply ahead of time and then withdraw later on so the advantage with this is i don't have any binary variables or any integer variables at all it is simply a linear integer problem having two power n continuous variables which is not a problem in the case of devanu there will be two power n 2048 continuous variables and today uh, you know you can solve large sizes linear problems continuous linear problems of these large sizes with uh, without too much of a difficulty how now the interesting thing is this out of all of these you thought because this is a linear problem there are n plus 1 constraints over here so out of the two power n continuous variables only n plus 1 fractions will actually be at most n plus 1 fractions of times will be non zeros the rest will be forced to zeros because you know an lp solution can be forced to be at a corner point so out of all the two power n uh, think about this as a system of equations in uh, uh, two power n variables and n plus 1 equations obviously there are more number of variables than equations so there are infinite number of solutions but i'm trying to maximize or minimize a linear objective what this does is it pushes the solutions to a corner point where out of all of these n plus 1 uh, uh, out of the 2 power n variables only n plus at most n plus 1 of them will be forced to be non zero all the other uh, you know 2 power n minus of n plus 1 variables or numbers will be forced to zero so i will end up having only n plus 1 fractions of times i have to worry about so i may have you know two power 2048 combinations in the devanur case but i really only have to worry about uh, 12 combinations 12 particular combinations i am not saying this is always be feasible but my our intuition has been our guidance and whatever we have done it on several examples and these 11 combinations are good enough so i only need to keep track of 11 combinations uh, of which valves are open and closed so then what do i do i now have an aggregated schedule i have the fractions i have to disaggregate this so i have to split this guy and then rearrange it in a particular in a particular manner so that i can end up meeting your daily demands when there is continuous withdrawal again now the number of binary variables has come down from 2 power n into i max to just n into i max because there are only or n plus 1 into i max because there are only n plus 1 states which are active and i need to only decide out of these i max times which of these n states are active so it is the number of binary variables is much smaller now and this is again a reasonably solved problem you can solve this in a reasonable amount of uh, time with most we will run this on desktop and it solves in a couple of seconds yeah you just explain what n plus 1 also yeah okay so think about this your tks are your decision variables your qs are known and the ds are known so how many tks are there two power n tks those are those many unknowns are there and how many equations are there n plus 1 because n tanks and one equation extra over it saying that they or we can think about these as normalization fact it's so n plus 1 equations and 2 power n unknowns so obviously there are infinite that's if it is feasible there are infinite number of solutions for this what linear if what simplex or any of these methods does for solving linear problem is it tries to put these to a corner point at the corner point solution uh, out uh, out of the uh, uh, several variables at most n plus 1 of them will be non zero and the rest are forced to be equal to zero that is your basic your corner point solution theory of theorem of linear programming at a vertex at an intersection point if you think about these in terms of basis variables and non basis variables 
only two of uh, two dimensions only two of the basis variables will be zero the three variables will be all non zero so likewise in this case n plus 1 of these will be non zero at most i'm not even saying n plus 1 have to be non zero at most n plus 1 have to be non zero if it is possible to supply the single state you could have a, you know just one particular state could be active what is ck ck is the cost uh, power cost uh, pa sorry the uh, power consumption for that particular for that particular uh, state if you are not doing a pumped system i could just have minimize the time some something like a wait here yeah wait so in this case because i know for each state i know what is the power consumption so total energy will be ck times tk and summed over all possible states if i am not doing a pumped system i will be just minimizing tk that is the total amount of time that is required or if i am doing equitable distribution i will try to minimize the percentage deviation in that case it becomes a qp but it's still solvable not doesn't not, not too much of it so as you can see we saw we converted the problem from a large scale mixed integer nonlinear problem to a linear prop to an integer linear problem which was still very com computation challenging because of the large number of decision variables then we decomposed it solved an lp and then realized that only n into i max binary variables will be needed of course this means that you know so this is a flow chart i start enumerate all the states and do hydraulic simulation for each state solve the relaxed lp search for a feasible schedule it is possible that with these n plus 1 states i am not able to meet the schedule in which case i have to go back and add some extra states so it's possible that for the devnor case uh, there are not 11 plus 1 12 maybe there are with the with the 11, 12 states that i have discovered from the lp it is not able to meet it in which case i can go back and add one more state and then see whether there is such a feasible schedule if the original problem is feasible this will end up becoming feasible you can guarantee that because if the original problem with discrete continuous control valves is feasible using by you know adding a couple of more conditions over here you can show that this is feasible and because each problem lp is a you can you have got a globally optimal solution ilp also in the worst case you know you can get a you can guarantee that you'll get a globally optimal solution or at least you can you can control the uh, uh, you know the gap between the upper and lower bounds that you obtain so you are guaranteed to get the globally optimal or at least you can guarantee the optimality gap in the solution so this is an example of a town which is uh, we are working with some people from tamilnadu water infrastructure company it was a dpr for a new municipal town a single pumping station for supplying water to eight tanks and because they can just at the design stage so obviously there is 24/7 it is continuous withdrawal over here so uh, we looked at this is the optimal schedule that we came up with by using only discrete valves and as you can see over here the way to read this gantt chart is for the first 31 minutes tank 1 6 and 7 are getting water tank uh, for the next half an hour or so tanks all the valves are closed then for one hour you open uh, valves to tanks 1 6 and 7 and if you can count the number of colors there are uh, uh, eight tanks there are not more than eight colors <coughs> here each color is a particular state which it tells you which particular valve is open and closed and this is we are guaranteed this is a minimal energy that is can be consumed if you are ready to work only with on off valves which is around 4800 kilowatt hours and the total pumping time is also 20 hours 18 minutes yeah you just shift the entire gantt chart to the left what would go wrong well you can't because there is also uh, uh, like because there is also continuous withdrawal at the same time so uh, this is at some this is not an arp, this is not just supply because there is also continuous withdrawal so it is possible that if you just shift it to the left you may end up uh, some capacity constraint would get violated some capacity constraint would get violated <coughs> either overfilling or under or uh, drying out and so on. so in this you are handling withdrawal also yes in this case i am handling withdrawal doctor no problem doctor yeah maybe later on i can show you we have this i have i should probably included those you know there, there are figures for the tank levels and so on so we also have made sure that tank no tank runs dry you can also put constraint saying i don't want to uh, i want to have at least 20% water left i don't want to let it run all the way dry so i at the same time i don't want it to go to 100% so my usable volume is only 20 80% that also we are guaranteeing that it can be and another thing you can notice is we have also put a constraint that no slot can be lower than half an hour because we don't want the number of changes to be significant You think about it. If you can make this as fine as possible, 
in the end as i said the original problem is feasible you'll always get a feasible solution over here if you are ready to make it infinitesimally small you will always end up getting a, if the original problem is feasible you this will be you will get a feasible schedule but you will end up giving several runs of iterations so this is uh, the even is the simplest schedule you fill one tank at a time which is what you know what most operators might want to do it ends up consuming nearly twice the amount of power but more importantly it's actually infeasible if you decided to fill only one tank at a time it ends up taking 40 hours so this is the optimal schedule which takes 4800 kilowatt hours takes 20 hours the other schedule is you know it's a heuristic schedule over here because if you look at this there are two tanks which are so called problematic uh, i think I, one is problematic in the sense one is at a height and the other has a large amount of water to be supplied so the schedule the heuristic was you first meet their demands first and then meet everybody else's normally what they do is just go back sir just put that this one yeah, yeah. yeah. just cluster it yeah. you are seeing say call it east and yeah. west yeah. one thing they do is you know take to cluster. the east take to yeah. the west and then you know subdivide yeah. generally that's so some kind of so in this case our heuristic was uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. you t2 you fill and t6 i think because either one of them was at a mix up this and that yeah. so uh, that is one schedule that we tried we could also have you know subdivided uh, this, this first and this first we didn't try those but anyway because this is we know this is an optimal schedule you will never get better than 4800 kilowatt hours and the time is uh, 20 kilo, 20 hours and the other one takes actually slightly longer 23 hours so this is the again uh, i have to go back and check all of these this is a devnor problem which i have been discussing with all of you these are the tank levels in all of the uh, uh, level uh, 10 tanks uh, 10 tanks right so there are 10 tanks and this is again with on off valves alone not with continuous control valves so all the demands are met and no tank is running dry or no tank is uh, this is meeting hitting the capacity i think this is one 1.5 lakh liters you can see it is hitting the capacity but then it doesn't overflow and the same time nothing is going below zero either and of course a lot of them hit the zero capacity but i said you could keep a buffer and say i think you only have 20 20 percent allowable it may reduce a feasible space uh, but you know the uh, it could be in this case at least in the base case we are able to get a solution over here but i had to go back and check each of these numbers very carefully uh, and then get back and we can share the final results after i go back so this is the osmanabad network revisited so this is uh, the this is using continuous control valves as i said and then this is using discrete control valves so this is the uh, if you notice, if you recall, the Bhavesh solution was 6 hours 31 minutes. This comes out to not a very significant change, 6 hours 28 minutes, only 3 minutes difference we have got over here by doing the by doing this optimal schedule. Uh, the only thing is that if I want to, if the demand for the first 3 tanks is increased by 20%, all you, you notice that what has happened is, is that only uh, the states have not changed. What has changed instead is the number, is the time for which each state is active. So it is a simpler solution that we think can be implemented. You just tell the operator, or you can you can tell the operator rather than doing this for 42 minutes, do this for a certain amount of time, and then you go and repeat the schedule, or repeat the same schedule, but except for a longer amount of time. Or even you don't even have to tell him if he thinks that somebody is going to consume more water, he keeps the valve to that tank open for a longer amount of time. So this is something which he can also easily implement, is what our uh, uh, feeling is, and this is especially important if you're going to do it work with. Uh, so, uh, if you increase the demand, the tank is still constant. Okay. Pardon? So, yeah. the tank okay. capacity. Okay. In this case, when I said increase the demand, uh, uh, assume that tank capacity, is okay. tank capacity is either high or <coughs> you are at the same time withdrawing and so on. So, so this is another problem. Uh, the same, they were the Usmanabad network, but with more constraints. For instance, we said that we don't want any valve to be switched on or off more than two times. And uh, because again, uh, a single uh, this assume that you know as I said, a lot of these are networks are operated manually. Uh, only because the same operator goes to villages four, five, and six and opens and closes. So at any time, only one of these valves can be opened and closed. And two and three will be given. They have to be given time, uh, time water only between slimes of three and twelve. Maybe because it's not really a tank, but it's a stand post. So which means they have to supply water at a reasonably good, reasonably comfortable period of time. So all these kinds of constraints you can now impose. 
this is something which you could not have done in your oper- in your conventional solution of operating all valves and let them fill and so on because now you have the specific constraints that no valve can be opened and closed more than once only one of the four five and six can be opened at the same time you know two and three can be supplied at a certain time and this is your optimal schedule obviously now the number of constraints that you have added there is no guarantee that you can actually meet the demands so you now uh, because you added all these constraints over here and now your state space is also limited and you are adding more and more constraints so there's no guarantee that you can meet the demands so what the interesting problem is to solve the equity problem and say i want to minimize the deviation and in this case the deviation maximum deviation is not more than 5% so nobody receives less than uh, 95% of their uh, demanded capacity and because it's a explicit optimization problem you can impose all of these constraints we are impose another constraint saying you know this is at the level of the villages which yeah. the entire uh, yeah, entire demand of that in entire village. so it's like your uh, reservoir and your uh, in other each of these reservoirs are tanks then there's another problem that we looked at uh, for the same uh, case study i mean for the same uh, network uh, you know this guy you cannot independently open and close these valves because the valve is very the village is much farther down so you cannot send an operator to open or close these valves so either this guy gets water when this valve is open or he does not get water so that is another constraint which you could impose and then do this then the other question that you asked do i need to really do in this case there are six do i need to do 64 simulations to get my to build my initial model we were able to show that you could work, you could you get a reasonably approx good enough solution by working examining only a fraction of those states from 15 out of these so obviously now i i make no claims about how well this will scale but assume that it scales you know a fourth of what uh, in this case at least it looks like you are able to work with exploring only a fourth of the number of states that we do okay so in the interest of time i'll go ahead and may, may skip this and just uh, talk about the other interesting part so this is Uh, a water network the experimental facility that we have built in uh, iit madras so this is just a snapshot this has there's a 600 liter tank over here from which water is pumped and there are these 400 liter reservoirs at this height this is around 3 meters and all the pipe sizes are 20 mm to 4 mm uh, and this is a completely reconfigurable network so this is just a snapshot of the network that over here that uh, It, it, this supplies water to these five demand points connected in this particular manner but as i said this is re- reconfigurable you can interconnect change these connections have more number of demand points and so on there are up to 20 demand points you can have and also they are right now they have all all the demand points at the same ground level but they there are you know provisions to put it put some at a height and some at a different height uh, there are some flow meters some continuous control valves all the demand points have solenoid valve at the inlet to regulate the supply and also solenoid valves at the outlet to regulate the to uh, impose a consumption pattern each of these tanks has a ultrasonic level sensor to measure the level of this so again uh, a certain amount of water had to be supplied for all of these tanks very similar to the usmanabad you fill one tank at a time it takes 3000 nearly an hour you open all valves and let them close whenever the demand is filled around 2200 seconds and the optimal schedule is around 2200 second uh, 100 seconds lower and uh, i uh, well the same osmanabad similar topology because that's a multi village network with larger distances similar topology we have implemented on the this particular network with similar kinds of constraints as i mentioned you know you cannot open certain valves you cannot close certain valves or you need to do only certain number of uh, operations at a time and you can do this interesting thing is I really even don't need the hydraulic model for doing any of these. And the reason why, remember, all I need to know is for one particular configuration of opened and closed valves, what are my flow rates? So I could just do an experiment and measure those flow rates and use this in a model. And that is exactly what we did with this. Did all of this was by the we did not use a hydraulic EPANET model at all. For all the two power five thirty two combinations, we recorded the what are the flow rates, used that data, and ended up with these schedules. so in the uh, other uh, ex- extreme case you don't even have to have a record or you don't even have to have a network model or the connectivity model because all you need to do is again my heur- our heuristic seems to be suggest that we can work with a fraction of these we record some data you collect you open and close certain valves because the valves are available to you at the inlet of the tanks open and close these valves record the flow rates and then use the limited amount of information build this model no guarantee of optimality if you are able to explore all the two power n combinations you can get the optimal So you're saying you don't need physicists 
very soon you might say you don't need mathematicians either. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this is finally an optimization problem. So, but again, this is as I said, stretching it to the hill over here. You may not end up with a situation where I don't uh, need any more network information. But the important problem point is. You don't need to maintain a network hydraulic model because when you want to maintain a hydraulic model, you need to maintain the connectivity and the physical parameters associated with that model. So you need to calibrating that model and so on. So this is uh, scheduler. Uh, this is on our RBC DSI website. At the design stage, I think you will need that. Yeah, at the design stage, of course. Uh, design stage, you will need. Uh, but design is uh, design stage. You will need to have that. And this is some field implementations that you have done. As I said, what you have done is we have retrofitted existing valves with electrical actuators. Install level sensors in some of the reservoirs and uh, transmitting the data using LoRa and recording it on a board. This is the IIT Madras. This campus, is right? this is these are some snapshots from the IIT Madras campus. Uh, so this is the overall architecture. We are using LoRa and we also done with GSM, but we are now currently using LoRa to collect all the data. We are not just able to collect the data; we are also able to actuate the valves. And again, uh, we are not using commercially available gateways. Uh, we have built a very low cost gateway because. These kinds of networks, you really don't need. Uh, it takes five minutes to open and close a valve, so you really don't need to collect. Uh, you know, it's unlikely that you're going to send actuation commands or you know collect level information. Levels also will take some time for to rise, right? So you don't. Your uh, data transmission rates can be significantly optimized. And these are again uh, some other level sensors in our. Uh, these are the in uh, underground reservoir and. Uh, these are some other valves in IIT Madras campus which we have retrofitted and there's a wireless box, a dashboard for monitoring the levels, for controlling the actuators, valves and these are some in interest of time and maybe quickly, oh, these advantages are uh, you can schedule this so as to supply the forecasted demand, ensure efficiency, ensure equitability, more importantly you can, uh, what we think is schedules can be implemented reliably, you don't have to uh, if you say a valve has to be opened at a certain amount of time, you can ensure that it is done because you are not relying on a, uh, a you know, manpower, human, humans, uh, removing to some extent human in the loop and importantly are retrofitting the existing systems with limited cost. So this is the scheme of the uh, multi-village scheme in Bombay that we are working with. So it is around 14 to 16 villages, several reservoirs, several problems which are several uh, things with wrong with this network. So some, again inequity is an issue. Uh, secondly, there is a power holiday every Friday, so no water is supplied to anybody on Friday. So what we have, the first level of demonstration we are going to do is uh, use the schedule to fill water ahead on Thursday. And because now you can have, you know, you can fill these reservoirs and open these valves from a remote location, you can now do these at unearthly hours of the time. And once the water has filled the reservoirs during the night, you can have the regular manpower because from the reservoirs to the end, end users it is by gravity. So you could possibly at least from getting from a situation of no water to a significant to some slight improvement maybe around 50 percent and then eventually we want to convince people that you can solve the inequity problem over here that is of course requires a lot more tact uh, as you can imagine each of these these are all it is, each of these villages is uh, you know <clears throat> it's not a single authority or group which control, uh, controls this network so this is again at i this is in safari Safari. This is in the uh, multi-village scheme and uh, uh, so the existing valves downstream of the MBR have been retrofitted with electrical actuators. Install some level sensors with the ultrasound with these powering them by solar and uh, pumps. There was frequent problem was with the pumps so we have put a pump protection panel to prevent overload relay trips and so on. This is a user interface. And this I like to conclude and say the other ongoing work is how to actually place these sensors and actuators in an optimal manner. I talked about fusing first principles models of data. Can we, uh, how do you calibrate, develop calibration models, and how do you do this calibration in an efficient manner? And uh, we uh, no. I want to go the whole hop from theory to lab to the field. Uh, the knowledge are several collaborators uh, over the past five or six years, funding from our Robert Bosch Center, I, uh, Water Technology Initiative, DST, IIT Madras. Uh, this is a sh that scheduling software is hosted. I told there are some problems with accessing this. I think I need to spend a little bit of time to understand why, especially when people from outside are accessing, there is some problem with accessing the software. So um, please use this and give us your feedback. And thanks again for your time and attention. And yeah, not too far, not too bad, the seven minutes over time. Thanks, thank you. Questions? Mayank? So, uh, what are the 
So as I said, if the original problem with discrete control valves is feasible, you will get a feasible solution over here because there's no other way. Right, but is it like, is it same as optimal solution when you do not? Uh, yeah, it will get the same as the optimal solution if the original problem is feasible with discrete control valves. I cannot claim that the original problem is feasible with discrete control valves. If it is feasible, it will be end up feasible because what I'm going to what one of the fixes that I'm going to do is I'm going to keep adding more and more states. In the end, I will end up with all the two power n states. I will also keep reducing my time slots as low as I can. So in the end, I will end up getting, if the original problem is feasible, I discover the feasible solution, but the expense of doing a lot more number of iterations. But our experience is this, you know, with several of these networks, with these networks which are physically motivated with all the realistic data, you know, for the for several networks that we analyzed, we got, we got feasible solutions without having to go through this uh, loop of, uh, without having to update this for now. What are the kind of heuristic statements for uh, working with fraction of the like instead of simulating all, all costs? Yeah, so we start with, uh, look, one of the things that we have noticed is, uh, maybe it should, uh, I'm not sure whether it comes over here. So one of the things that we have noticed is all of these states have roughly the same amount of uh, power consumption around two, four, th 2005. Four, 240 kilowatts. So that seems to be heuristic that all of these states are, they may be looking very different, but they all end up consuming more or less the same amount of power. And therefore, another way to, if it's a pump system, we will look at first the states which are consuming more or less the same amount of power and keep you working with those first. Because those seem to be some good solutions. Can we estimate the flow rates of the states that we found measure? Yeah, you could. I mean, you could then do some kind of a. You could you could build a hydraulic model, and and then based on that predict the flow rates with the limited number of information. You could build a hydraulic model and predict the number of flow rates and predict the flow rates elsewhere. Or you could do a complete data-driven model and try to do some kind of, you know, regression or ML and then predict those kinds of flow rates also. Um, so, uh, I mean, just building up on the question that was asked, uh, somehow the uh, the topology. Uh, should sort of indicate which things you can keep on and off in a simultaneous way, which subset should be on. So that could also so be things good. which are far away, perhaps they are independent as well, when something in between is turned off. So topology alone is not enough because demand is also there. So you could have, uh, you know, somebody who is very close by, and but he has a significant amount of demand. Somebody who is hydraulically disfavorable, but also has a very high demand, like in one of your Devanur examples. So, Topology alone may not be enough. You need to look at, and therefore we did not look at that particular thing. It didn't seem to suggest topology alone or demand alone. What this seems to suggest is it ends up becoming all the states are more or less the same power consumption over here, at least for this particular example. Over here. Now, is there any benefit uh, to keeping the pump on at all times so that there is no on off of the pump, except that maybe you're not pumping as much water when you keep it on? Yes, possible. You could, you could do that, yeah. So you could put in such constraints. You could like put in such constraints that uh, there is some pumping throughout the day. So to what extent are these constraints sort of configurable by a, by a third party user? Does one need to go to your uh, code and? Uh, yeah. So and you should use the software as such. I don't think it can handle any of these complicated constraints as yet. It's just a basic schedule where uh, you just give the network data and so on, and the demands. And also, <coughs> right now it can take in time varying tariffs. I mean, uh, tariffs at different times of the day. With other constraints, we'll have to work and then incorporate those. And so on. How often is the schedule calculated, determined? Well, so right now, these are determined in offline. So in reality, you will have to determine this. Uh, I mean, if you think you're running a schedule for every day, you'll have to re do this every day at least, because you know, the actual consumption may be different from what was supplied and so on. So the levels will not be exactly the same as what you predicted. We may have supplied more water, less water, and so on. So you have to keep doing this in a uh, regular basis. What what this can also be done is what we do in model predictive control of receding horizon control. You know, you keep a moving horizon of 24 hours, and you keep doing this every hour also. So you keep collecting the information and you feed it back, and that gives you some. In some sense, if the demand is higher than what was predicted, you can take corrector. You don't have to wait for a whole day. You can correct for it at the first hour itself, for every hour itself. So all the, those are real uh, real time implementations which we have to worry think about. Once we actually do this in the field, we'll get some more data on uh, some more feel of how really 
how often we need to do this reoptimization and so on. Sir, do you have any framework for handling problems in the system? Let's say a pipe breaks somewhere. So how do you handle that? Do you have those frameworks in place? Well, I mean, in this case, a pipe break would mean that uh, <coughs> that pipe is not uh, available for them, that link is broken. So that has to be manually reconfigured and so on. No, the no, losses he's asking. So pipe break, obviously, you are going to lose over that time period. Oh, yeah, that, that's exactly so, right. So not only so that is leakage, that, yeah, the yeah. mass also you lost. So, so you that, reschedule now. Right? So then yet, that's why they, every hour rescheduling may help. Where you know, where if there's a leak somewhere, so therefore the, the actually consumption was more than what you predicted, but somebody's still not getting water, so we have to recompute this. And then, the idea of receding horizon control is you take this information and you keep uh, the horizon, you never reach the horizon, but you keep going. The horizon also moves, you also move. So, in terms of that pipe break, what does it translate to in terms of the variable subscription rate? Because that's what we are talking about. Does it mean that you set some indicators to zero? No, well, so what will happen is the uh, actual supply will be less or more than for a certain number of tanks, right? So that will be that will introduce an uncertainty in any some of these. So your QJ, if there's a pipe break, it will be either more for a certain number of for certain tanks, it will be lower because certain amount of water is going away, which you're not accounting for. Now the question probably is uh, do you have a mechanism to reward or penalize uh, the thing, you know, get the that link lost something, yeah. so you have to penalize it. So and of course, from elsewhere you have to pull out, pull out. So and then give it. So, give it. so we have to, so we have to reward some, some things which are so working all so the time. Therefore, we have to reward it. One way is you can adjust the weights. Yeah, some that. of the weights have to adjust. What we have also done, for instance, is possibly uh, CK, you know. Yeah, the CK could adjust the weights. What we have also done is, uh, see here, rather than saying that these demands have to be met exactly, what we can say is you have a buffer and say it has been met greater than a certain amount and then that takes into a, that but you cannot choose these arbitrarily you cannot you could say i want to have five percent buffer over there so in which case if there's a loss in five percent in some place maybe you can meet these demands we'll just give it so otherwise you could do this what we could do is either you can do this completely as a stochastic optimization problem or you could convert it and make form it as a robust optimization problem where all of these are uncertain and therefore then this becomes a robust lp these constraints then become second order cone constraints. There is a, it's not equal to DK. It's equal to DK plus a certain pen, uh, uh, back off factor. <coughs> so so all of those you could do. Just to add to that, though all of us know with our good power supply, good pumping, things can run 24 bar set. And I mean, 24 hours pump can run. Still many things are designed for 22 hours. Yeah. Two hours cushioning is kept. Yeah. So like that possibly you should have a one slot here cushioning. Some slot where is that will be used for all these so exactly. agencies. Where that, is another, that is why I also said, go around uh, and then you know, you can always. That is why I said, in the, we also minimize the time. So, which means you are actually. You have one slot there. So, for instance, this uh, arc, this uh, so called ARCOD problem, we consume only 20 hours and 18 minutes. So, there is nearly 3 hours of time left. So, these can also be used to serve as your buffer. So, if you find that because of the leak, some tanks are not getting the demand required amount of water, you could. You know, use that extra three hours to uh, supply those uh, water over there. Is there any redundancy in the networks, like multiple pipes? So yeah, so in this, this is, these are examples of branch networks. There are, of course, today we are talking about there are loop networks. Uh, so, but most multivalent schemes are that is a transmission side are only a branch networks. Uh, these are all simple. Most of the time, with redundancy is out of the day. They deliberately build it because you know you lose that one track at least. You, you can get uh, recon, you can get this back. Home. I uh, wanted to understand a little bit more about this uh, operation. You said that you can measure. So is this like a, like a real time flow is available, or someone is just declaring the tank? <coughs> how is the consumption reported finally? What yeah. is the current uh, status? So you said that we will get some estimate of the demand mm -hmm. for that power or access. So, so that is for building these models. Uh -huh. So for building the models, that's what we are going to do over here is we have to put these level sensors. And then use that to build these models. That's what we're going to do in the. Uh, but for for a live system. For a live system, as I was talking to these people from Bangalore, there seems to be able. They are so able to connect. Every 15 minutes. 15 minutes. At the uh, aggregate point, which is supplying to the distribution network, mm -hmm. so we know exactly what the total is. That's uh, so that will be about five thousand households, which are reported from some places. Yeah. So that will be about two thousand to five thousand households. We know what their total consumption is once. So this is as uh, Bangalore seems to be having a very well no, instrumented. This is one extreme. There are a lot of cities across where the, even the measurements at the consumer node, the metering itself is not there, other than very, very skeletal. So, so second I, question is, what do you envision as in terms of automation here? So is it, are you saying that 
will be uh, I'll be moving towards a centrally controlled with a lot of feedback from various measurements and these kind of schedules will be deployed. That is our hope. That's for the uh, even before schedules being deployed, I see that seems to be a for instance when we went to Safali this village, right? So one of the first things which they are interested in is automation. So whether you come up with optimal schedules or feasible schedules is one thing, but at least it gives them a way of opening valves and closing valves because this village scheme runs over 15 kilometers from end to end. And they are surprisingly, it's a lot of operating expense for them to have several man, val, you know, valve men going and opening and closing these. So one of the first things that they are is automating the existing operations. In, in IIT policy. In IIT also for instance. Is it, is it automated? So right now part of it is automated. The gray, so the drinking water network is going to be revamped. So what we have done is on the grey water network. So for instance a single operator who operates the entire grey water network. Now he has give, been given additional task for operating some other, if you come to a new academic complex or these fountains and so on. So he operates the same place and the grey water network is close to the research park. So. He actually wants a console right now in the main new academy complex from which he can give the command to open and close these valves. Because if it is not automated, the question I have is that one is robustness about the model itself and second is robustness of the implementation of yeah, the exactly. That is why I said one of the advantages I said was because it is automated, you can have reliable implementation of the schedules. For instance, you know, you could say ask somebody to go and open the valve at 2 o'clock in the yeah. you know, morning. There's no guarantee that he'll actually open it at 2 o'clock. He may have kept it open at one, uh, early at night or he may have gone and closed it. At least suppose he's operate, open it on 2 to 4 in the morning. There's no guarantee that he's going to do that. And there's no other feedback besides the flow that we measure from basically. During the most advanced systems, you're saying the feedback we get is it the flow. What is that from information? Flow that get levels. Yeah. And if these valves are actuated, then it also sends you a status command on what is the current position. So. For instance, here you have the current valve position. If these are actuated, if this has a positioner, it will can tell you what is the current valve position of it. Let's uh, take a let's stop here. Let's thank. Uh, thank